get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bar, Hinge Water, Quest Nutrition, P90X, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 creates 100% outsourced VIP special events or mini conferences for software companies or conference organizers who they want to engage their highest level customers or attendees or attract more of them. We do them all over the country. We hosted the events in the past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, none in Canada yet, Tara, um, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas. And if your company sees the value of bringing your highest level customers together to connect and collaborate, learn more at rise25.com, see if your community qualifies. And I also want to thank my friend John Rulin for introducing me to today's guest by sending me a large package of their amazing products, Smart Sweets, um, because he knows I really care about health and I have two young girls at home who love sweets, but we don't want to deprive them of that, so what do we do, right? So we get a healthy version of what they like. Right, and that's why Tara created this. Um, you can check out his book at giftologybook.com where he talks about how to cut through all the noise and track more referrals or rulinggroup.com. And so today I'm very excited. Tara Bosch, the founder of Smart Sweets, and her mission is to help you kick sugar. She started Smart Sweets after forming an unhealthy relationship with food and seeing the negative effect sugar has on your health. And after spend, this is really impressive, Tara, the fact that you did this. After spending months recipe testing in her kitchen with gummy bear molds from Amazon, she actually innovated a healthy gummy bear. And they were able to raise $3.6 million. And in short order, they've produced stellar products that are found in over 3,000 stores across the U.S. and Canada. By the end of the year, they'll be in over 10,000 stores stores like Whole Foods, Target, GNC, and many online channels. Tara, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so stoked to be talking together. So it kind of goes back to your grandma, right? Your grandma was a bit of an inspiration. Talk about that. Yeah, my grandma really was my best friend growing up. Um, me and her enjoyed sugar in all forms all the time. Candy what was your favorite? Wanted. Like your favorite girl, yeah. what was your favorite candy? Um, gosh, it's hard to choose one because we had so many. For me, I liked anything sour. Um, and for her, she liked um, anything sweet. Mm. So I would have the like Sour Patch Kids or um, the Sour Soothers and she would have your gummy worms um, or your fruity gummy bears. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was really me and her just had this relationship growing up where we would enjoy candy all the time together. Um, and on occasions like birthdays and Christmas and, and Halloween, candy was always the most prevalent thing. Um, and so for me, um, it was really shocking when um, more recently she sat down with me and she shared that she actually regretted having so much sugar, namely from candy over the years because of how it impacted her health and how she felt about herself. Um, and so that was really shocking that as an 88 year old woman, my grandma was still feeling poorly about herself because of what she was putting in her body. And I could relate to that because growing up, I had an unhealthy relationship with food that affected my confidence as well. It's hard to believe that with how much you've done at such a young age. Talk about that because people would see you now and think, oh, she's always had all the confidence in the world. She feels she can, you know, attack anything. What was, what were you thinking then? What was your mentality then? Yeah, I mean, for me, it always stemmed back to my relationship with food. So um, growing up, I would restrict myself from having things like candy. Then I would have um, one or two candies. And because the sugar in it is so addicting, I would binge. And then it just kept me in this perpetual cycle of low self-esteem and, and um, body confidence. And so I didn't feel confident enough to 
transfer that over and act on my ideas um, or really believe that I was capable of bringing something to life. So it wasn't until I actually had that healthy relationship with food that I felt empowered really with the confidence that I could actually do anything that I wanted in the world. Um, and that took me a long time and um, I don't think it's something that ever necessarily, it's like, at least in my my journey so far, it's not like you have confidence and then it's there. I feel like it's a daily thing where I'm like, am I capable? Can I do this? <laughs> How do you um, deal with the self-talk? Like you said, you always have to deal with those constant I, you know, thoughts creeping up. How do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, I it's, it's, well, one, I think being aware that I think it's really reassuring knowing that um, the people that I admire the most and my mentors and, and different people that are doing really cool things, everyone has that and everyone has that voice in their head and it, it's just about managing it. So I kind of almost view it as like, kind of like a, I remove myself and like talk to myself and give myself the advice that I would a friend. Um, so if, I, if in my head I'm thinking, no, you're not capable or you can't do this. I'd be like, hey, I, I just, how would I talk to a friend? I'd tell them they're capable. i tell them they got this. So I kind of just talk to myself in that same way and, and try and kind of um, do things in my day-to-day -day life that it intentionally kind of, I call it mind fuel. So listening to things like podcasts, YouTube videos, um, audio books that kind of subconsciously plants the seeds as well, I think. And, you know, a supplement job, a job at a supplement store also influenced you. Yeah, that was a, a really pivotal moment for me on my journey, um, where it was my second year um, at university, and I got this summer job at this supplement store, and the uh, my boss, um, who ran the supplement store, she was really an influential person in my life, where she really introduced to me the idea that um, food actually is something where you can enjoy your favorite foods and still feel good about it. It doesn't have to be this black or white, cut out candy, ice cream, all your favorite things. It's just finding smaller, smarter choices. So for example, Greek yogurt instead of sour cream, um, and then beginning to swap stevia for sugar. So it, it really was this shift for me where I was like, wow, I actually don't have to deprive myself. It's just finding those better choices that allow me to feel good about myself and enjoy them in a sustainable way. So what was that moment that you thought, you know, I just have to create this whatever? Did you know it was going to be a gummy bear or some kind of candy? What were you thinking? No, I, I had I had absolutely no idea. It was kind of funny because um, so the I had this conversation with my grandmother. Um, and at that point in time, um, it, it was something where as soon as I had the conversation, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to find you something um, with candy that you can actually feel good about having. So I went to natural grocer and, and just grocery store shelves and went looking for something that was addressing sugar in a natural way. Um, and that kind of sparked my journey into realizing two things. The first was that actually nothing existed in the candy world that um, was eliminating sugar without adding a bunch of artificial crap. And then secondly, really that the candy industry seems to kind of be the epicenter of sugar in the food industry and the impacts that sugar in our foods is having us uh, on us as a society. Yet despite that, it's still being excessively added. Um, so in discovering that, I originally thought I was kind of doing bad like market research because I was like, how does this not exist in, um, in 2016 at the time? And so that really... I, seeing that gap um, is what kind of gave me the conviction right away that I wanted to innovate the first candy that kicks sugar and start this quest on the mission. So you knew at that point, it's not out here, I'm going to create it. Yeah, exactly. Well, it, it was um, like companies, I know you mentioned earlier, like Quest, for example, where in different verticals, I was seeing it being done. And I was seeing the responsiveness from consumers to being like, finally, we have access to these products that are smarter choices. But in the candy world, it just seems so kind of prehistoric dinosaur age where it was either you're having packed full of sugar or you're having no sugar at all, but a ton of sugar alcohols and artificial ingredients um, that had kind of a laxative effect. So we'll talk, let's talk about the journey for a second. So you set out, 
you have no background in creating candy. You set <laughs> out to do this. Uh -huh. All right. So take me through a little bit about, you know, we talked a little about you found molds on Amazon. So what did you do? What did you creating that first product look like? Yeah. Well, yeah. So got the mold from Amazon um, and then realized really quickly that Google is actually a really powerful resource that it's nowadays so commonly said, oh, hey, Google it. But I found that when you actually Google it, um, the world is at your fingertips. So I quickly found um, different raw material suppliers and learned that they were willing to give me abundant amounts of um, testing materials. I didn't tell them I was working from my kitchen at the time in a basement, but um, <laughs> they were sending all these raw materials. Um, and then it was really just me in my kitchen with a pot and a candy thermometer um, and the mold. And, and so the first product, the first initial months, the product was horrible. It, um, <laughs> it, it resembled candy because of the molds, but it tasted um, texture, mouthfeel, sweetness, nothing like candy. So it was an evolution <laughs> to say it graciously. <laughs> so then where, when did you come, how long did it take you to come to the first thing that was edible for you? Yeah, it took me, um, it took me about two and a half months. At the time I was actually testing marshmallows as well. And so um, the marshmallows became um, edible and were viable before the gummy bears. The gummy bears took me about two and a half months till I um, gave it to my friends and family at the time and they didn't spit it out and say this is nasty. <laughs> and so at the time, what are you thinking is next? Once you get this product, you, you found a product that worked, a formulation that worked, what'd you do? Yeah, so I'm at the point in time where I was in the summer between semesters at university um, and I decided in my heart that once that as soon as I started recipe testing, I just knew that this was what lit me up on fire and I just felt like it was what I meant was meant to be doing at this time and space. And so I made the decision to drop out of university. Um, so I not return to school in the fall. And then at the same time, I also was accepted into an accelerator program um, that was called The Next Big Thing, um, founded by a fellow, um, his name is Ryan Holmes, and he started a company called Who Suite. Um, and so dropped out of university, um, joined the accelerator program, and then really just began working as aggressively um, as I could to bring the product to its very first shelf. What are some, what's some of the advice and some of the things you learned in the, in the accelerator? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it the environment was probably the, the most important learning experience where I was a sole founder, and so it was really just that um, initial realization that everyone's going through the same things that I was with the self-doubt and the, oh my God, how am I going to do this? I just, but I, I know I'm going to, I just don't know how I'm going to yet. Um, and, and really just, um, I think the understanding that as long as you start and you don't stop and you continue walking into the darkness of the unknown, you will figure it out. Um, and that became really apparent to me when I was surrounded by different people doing the same things and then um, became introduced to different people who had built companies successfully. And, and it just seemed really that the theme was just don't stop um, and that nobody really knows what they're doing, but they figure it out. So then talk to me about the first finished bag of product, right? Because mm -hmm. then you have the, the, the product, you can eat it, right? But you have this nice looking name, packaging, all of that. So talk about yeah. a little of the evolution of the, the packaging piece. Yeah, so I mean, originally the company's name was Stevie Sweets. Um, and so the packaging and the name of the company was vastly different from what it is um, now. And um, basically what kind of spurred the evolution of getting to the first bag, the finished product, um, was that we were supposed to launch on shelves. At this point, it was August, at January um, of the following few months. And our manufacturer dropped out on us in oh, December. Um, so I had um, about 500 doors locked in. Um, and then all of a sudden, the manufacturer pulled the plug and wasn't going to move forward with us. Um, so the only other manufacturing partner that would take a chance on me and using a formula without sugar, sugar alcohols, or artificial sweeteners 
um, their minimums were really high. So I was like, shoot, I am going to have to try and raise money because my debt financing is not going to meet where we need to go. Um, so it was just like a few days before Christmas and I was, I laugh now, but I was like scraping LinkedIn, just cold and mailing people. Um, and a few people graciously responded, but nobody wanted to try the product because the name of the company was Stevie Sweets. And I found out there was a negative connotation with Stevia traditionally and its aftertaste. Um, so that was a blessing because it spurred the name change to Smart Sweets, um, which was a big part of the initial packaging. Mm. Um, and then... From there, it was just little iterations on the bag, which got us to our first shelf um, in August of that year. So just under a year um, from the beginning of the recipe testing. So how did you get a manufacturer? How did you did you have to raise money? What? Yeah. Yeah. Well, to to get from um, yeah to get the financing to launch on our first shelf, I basically signed my life away in my 2009 Honda Fit, which was my only asset. <laughs> um, so I, I did 105k debt financing um, through local banking programs here, and that got us to basically launching on our very first shelf. Hmm. And then you've raised money since then. So how did you do that? Yeah. Um, so with Smart Suites, um, and really kind of looking at okay, what the end goal is, which is to be the global leader in innovating confectionery products and creating accessibility to. Um, to products that people can actually feel good about. Um, we really, I wanted to approach it of, okay, scaling aggressively. So that's where the 3.6 million came in, um, where this year um, we just finished our first year on shelves and we're entering um, the US. And so that capital is really what um, allowing us to increase our manufacturing rapidly as well as um, the innovations that we launch. And then the philosophy from there is really to sustain ourselves organically through cash flow and then working with our bank as a true debt financing partner. I mean, is it from the relationship with the accelerator? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah kind of a mix of both. Um, some relationships in the accelerator, others just through um, LinkedIn. I, I met folks in the food world and that flourished into them being mentors. Um, but the seeds of it really was... Um, meeting people through the accelerator and then kind of just random experiences as well. A good kind of example is one of our investors. Um, I met him through this reality TV show that reached out uh, and was looking for a young female founder that was raising capital. Um, and at the time I wasn't, but I just said yes to the opportunity. Um, and we met through there and he mm. became one of our advisors and then one of um, my closest mentors who opened up his network, um, what we needed to raise. Um, so yeah, really just through mentors that were from the Accelerator program and random happenings. So you were on Dragon's Den, right? Uh, so yeah. how was your experience on Dragon's Den? Yeah, it was one of it was again one of the, just like a random opportunity that came up that I just had to say always say yes. Um, and so the executive producer called me in last year. In May, and she was like, "Hey, like one of my teammates tried your product. Think it would be fun for you to come out and pitch to the Dragons." Um, and she's like, "I would need you here in the next week and a half." So I was like, "Okay, sure." Um, so went and pitched, and my only expectation going into that was to really not puke or fall down the stairs, and neither of those things happened. So that was wonderful. Um, yeah, but it was a really great experience, and we were fortunate enough to have a really awesome reaction. Um, from the dragons, really cringy to watch myself on TV, but um, a good experience and good brand awareness. So, Terry, you know, oftentimes when I talk on people, uh, talk with people who have been on Shark Tank, what well, kind of what happens, um, even if they get a deal, it's not always guaranteed. Things follow through in the same pathway. Yeah. Talk to me about like after Dragons Den, or like actually during what happened, and then after. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, during on the show, all five of the Dragons made an offer and they doubled our valuation, which was really gracious of them. So closed a deal on air. Um, off air, what happened was um, our bank had just extended um, debt financing to us. And so I was able to push back us needing to raise. Um, so I just ended up stepping away from the deal off air. 
um, for that reason. But um, but yeah, it was, they were really gracious. And um, he, Jim, who I accepted an offer with, I've stayed in contact with, as well as some of the other Dragons just as mentors. So I want to go back to the time where you signed your life away, right? Yeah. That time. So now it may, it's obvious, right? But then it's not so obvious. It's a big gamble, right? So what what is your thought process? Then you're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, you use the word sign my life away. So at the time, that's probably what it seemed like. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, kind of, it would, in, in each kind of plunge where you may look from the outside, like you're kind of jumping off a cliff and taking a really big risk. For me, I kind of always saw it through the lens of that I still do with um, things of, it being more, it'd be more of a sacrifice to not do it and to not really put myself and and all my um, efforts and uh, and really thought process into making this vision in my head happen. So for me, I kind of just looked at at the lens of what's the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is um, it fails. I get a job. I pay the debt financing back, and when I'm 90 years old. Uh, in my care home, I don't regret taking the opportunity to um, to create something that really set my soul on fire. So it was always more of a sacrifice to not dive in, and it never really crossed my mind that it would be a risk. It just yeah. didn't feel that way. Terry, I think I don't want to glaze over, in the short order, what you've done is very remarkable, right? You're, you're talking about, you're dealing with product, getting a product, then you're dealing with the packaging, getting the packaging right, and you're dealing with manufacturing and logistics, which is a whole other animal, and then actually, you know, raising money and finding the money. And we haven't taught, in, in all of that, you have then were able to get into a certain number of stores, okay? Mm -hmm. First of all, how, and all these moving pieces at once. Did you have a team around you or are you just working 24-7 at this point? Yeah, well, both. <laughs> okay. I think both. Um, so um, this time last year, um, it was myself and one other team member. Now there's 16 of us, so the team has since grown. Mm -hmm. um, yep. But I think, I think just driving forward all those moving parts at once, the manufacturing, um, the distribution, the funding, um, the the building this kick sugar community. I think it, it really looking back and now still, it's just like kind of relentlessly trying to drive the wedge forward across all fronts. And so like, for me, I always kind of have a list of like the top five things that need to happen mm -hmm. in order to, that will like play the biggest role in moving the needle forward and then relentlessly driving those things. Um, and so to get all that set up initially, it was and like still is kind of like a 20, for our always on thing, but I've been blessed enough to have people much smarter than myself around me, um, between mentors and then the first team member, and now um, now the different teammates that um, are just Einsteins and in, in what they do. And so um, I think it's kind of been both just like relentlessly driving the wedge forward and then finding people and getting radically honest about what I'm not good at and being proudly the stupidest person now on the team, not in a self-deprecating way, but just in a kind of being real, I guess, about and having no ego attached to the fact yeah. that I'm actually not good at most things. <laughs> Every, you know, everyone has certain strengths and you know yeah. things that they don't like doing. Um, so how did you get into those initial stores? Yeah, so the very first store that said yes, um, I had been emailing her for like, I think it was like two weeks and then I was like, okay, screw it, I'm gonna call her every single day. So I called her and then um, she said, okay, come to the store, like come present your product. Um, so that that instance, I drove to the store and then I had just this feeling of like wanting to puke and so I was like, should I drive away? Like maybe I'll just try and contact her and email again and so it was just um, that, removing myself from the situation as a third person being like, Tara, you're going to go in there. Um, and and then, yeah, that was how I got the first store. And then from there, it kind of gave me the confidence that, okay, people will actually take a chance on you. Um, and so from there, it was just a lot of calling, a lot of emailing, a lot of LinkedIn-ing, a lot of seeing who my mentors um, could connect 
me too to drive the wedge um and then our first national partner um was popeye's supplements which is a supplement chain of about 150 stores in canada um yeah and then was that the same thing you just relentlessly contacted them that was a little bit of serendipity as well um i had been contacting them for some time with um no luck they were responding here and there but nothing was really moving forward um and i um signed smart tweets up for our first trade show and it was this fitness expo um in canada and popeyes their booth serendipitously was just directly across from ours and so we at that show we were just absolutely swarmed um and so popeyes being right across from our booth we're seeing this and so after the show um got connected to the buyer who became a big supporter and is still an incredible mm -hmm order today and, and it happened from there so it was a little bit of serendipity so Tara, what was it at the booth that allowed you to be swarmed because i'm sure mm -hmm. a lot of the booths were not swarmed yeah i mean i think it was um one of the things i think was just we were this new cool product that kind of appeared out of nowhere um and and was letting people eat candy with with nothing attached to it of guilt or regrets or um, anything but just actually being able to eat it, feel good about it, and then move on with your day. So I think it was just that, where um, it, people just were so fascinated by actually being able to have candy and then feel good about it, um, where Quest, I think, had just launched their chips at the time, and so there were chips, and then there was healthier ice creams or protein ice creams, but um, this was the first really better-for-you option in the candy space, and so people were excited by that. Let's talk about the ingredients, right? So I've tried both the sour gummy bears and the fruity gummy bears. Both are good. Um, different family members prefer different ones. Like you said, you prefer the sour stuff. Your grandma prefers the sweet stuff. Um, so I want to talk about the, the ingredients, right? So in the um, sour gummy bears, we have prebiotic soluble fiber from tapioca, chicory root fiber, gelatin, lactic acid, citric acid, rice flour, malic acid, fumaric acid, fruit and vegetable juice for the color and a natural fruit flavor. And then there's coconut oil and stevia leaf extract and carnauba wax. So how is that, has that changed at all in the past couple years? Has the ingredient changed? And what was the tough part about you know, obviously, I'm sure there's certain reasons why manufacturers include certain ingredients because it's easier to produce. And this is probably, I imagine, a little bit more difficult to produce. Yeah, the, the ingredients have actually pretty much stayed the same since, um, since the first product that launched on shelf. And I think the reason for that is because I was um, from really, really stubborn and not wanting to actually put something on shelf that was, I didn't want it to be an evolution of ingredients. I wanted it to be the best ingredients from day one that we could possibly put in the product. Um, and with candy, I think the challenge is that all that candy is, is corn syrup and sugar. Um, and so when you're removing both of those things, it creates this really interesting technical challenge of, okay, how are you gonna get the bulking properties of sugar, the texture, the flavor profile? Um, and so that's really where I had to get creative both from a, um, like a taste point as well as from a manufacturing standpoint how is how are we going to create a formula that actually works when you scale it up outside of the kitchen um, so those are the, I think the biggest challenges in getting there yeah it seems like um, a couple non-negotiables for you were mm -hmm. sugar alcohol free I yeah. imagine um, they're GMO free too yeah okay. and then yeah. Um, basically no artificial anything mm -hmm. in general. Yeah, exactly. I really wanted to say, hey, okay, um, how can we bring um, candy back to something that you can actually authentically feel good about? And that starts with each ingredient on the list. Um, and so at the end of the day, I, I really felt that by having nothing artificial, so um, from the the colors coming from beta carotene and carrot, the natural fruit flavors really looking at, okay, where is the flavors actually derived from and is it from the fruit itself? Um, to the, the stevia, to the natural acids, um, and then the non-GMO piece was really important um, to me as well with 
I guess, kind of my personal philosophy on GMOs and then sugar alcohols, just really, um, for me and my own experience in, in trying to go sugar free, I experienced the really harsh side effects that having sugar alcohols can hold in such excessive quantities because in candy, um, if you're going to use that instead of sugar, there has to be a lot of them packed in there. Um, and so that was really something that was important to me to create an experience that consumers wouldn't experience any side effects from um, having your stomach cramp or anything like that and sugar alcohols cause that. So I was also reading Tara, that you're a teal fellow, mm -hmm. right? How does that work? Yeah, so um, yeah, so that was a really big blessing. Um, so that basically Peter Thiel, he founded this accelerator program really that um, that really their purpose is at its core just to connect young people doing cool things from different verticals and leaving it really organically to them to connect with each other. Um, the cool thing as well was there was a 100K grant, which was really helpful um, early on. And um, and so how that kind of happened was um, found the program coordinator on LinkedIn um, and just made sure that she did not forget <laughs> who I was or who's, what we were doing. So emailed her every week for like the course of six months to follow up and just made sure they always had product in their office. Um, and then they had the retreat where they kind of we all pitched there was I think a hundred of us pitching and then they narrowed it down to the um the 20 that they were going to accept in the cohort um that again has been the biggest blessing from the the sense that most of the companies there aren't food companies there's there's like an 18 year old creating a robotic arm and for um and, and just uh, like the people who I'm like, I do not, I was having massive imposter syndrome. I'm like, I do not belong in this room with you. Um, but just people who I'm really inspired by. And okay. um, so okay. it's been a really great network to or community to have open up. That's great. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You have to keep track of a lot of things, right? Like you said, I'm going to email this person or call them every week or every day, whatever it takes. What are some of the software and tools you use on a daily basis? Yeah, there's one called Mixmax mm -hmm. um, that I, I use Gmail and Mixmax has been the, like the biggest blessing because it does it kind of functions um, as as a personal assistant in the sense that um, you can schedule emails, you can set sequences. Um, so for example, if I'm emailing a buyer um, and they don't open my email or read it by X time then it starts this sequence um, where it's a really organic sequence that has a lot of if then thens. If they open it, then it does this. Or if they don't open it, then it does this. So it's really personalized um, as well as it sets different reminders for you. And so it takes the brain work out of having to remember to follow up because it will ping me at a certain time being like, hey, follow up with Catherine or Mike. Um, as well as it just has different features like allowing you to embed articles and like previews of articles in emails and so it, it gives um, a, a kind of cool like digital experience within an email so it's that's been a really kick-ass tool that I, I now would have a hard time living without <laughs> what other ones do you use on a daily basis yeah um, from an email standpoint Mixmax is Mixmax is pretty much is is what I use there's another one called Active Inbox that I really like because it kind of turns your inbox into a to-do list. So you can set due dates on emails um, and, and they go away until the due date. That's really helpful. Um, but those are really the only two that I use from like a task management standpoint. I don't use Asana or, um, or anything like that. What about on the site? What kind of platform do you use for Everyone should check out, by the way, smartsweets.com and check out the products. Um, what do you use to run the site? Yeah, we use Shopify, mm -hmm. um, which has been a really great platform um, and simple, easy to use. I'm not a coder, um, and so it makes it really a, a simple interface to work with um, and to make little tweaks to as needed. Um, yeah, so that's what we use for our e-commerce. So, Talk about building your team a little bit. So who are the first hires and then who's going to be, who are you who are going to need in the future as you keep growing? Yeah, um, 
yeah, I think that I think the team is has definitely been um, the most rewarding and the most challenging thing um, to build out because it's um, it's been a mix of a few things from kind of deciding when when do we need what role um, and then finding incredible humans um, to to join the squad and that want to take a risk on our mission and and really intrinsically believe that what we're doing needs to exist in the world um, and so. A year ago is when it was myself and our first squad member. Um, the first squad member, she joined the month that we launched on shelves, so August 2016. Um, and really, she came on board as a, as a all the hats. Um, so me and her um, really wore all the hats. Um, her jam previously to Smart Suites has been marketing, um, but she did marketing as well as everything and anything that came up. So the really important thing between me and her and, and her being the first team member that came on board was um, someone that was willing to figure it out with me um, and was willing to do anything that was needed from um, packing boxes at midnight with me um, to, <laughs> to doing um, to doing um, warehouse communications or anything and everything under the sun. Mm. Um, so me and her wrote it out until um, about this time last year and then really just got radically honest with, okay, what are the key gaps that we're going to need here in order to build out the team and what am I really not good at um, that's going to hold us up from getting to where we want to go. Um, and so we kind of bucketed it out. Um, first bucket was sales. Um, so brought on board two incredible humans um, as our director of sales that had been with the company called Vega previously and, and so had really been part of a magical team. Yeah, um, yeah they, people don't know what that is. It's uh, yeah. kind of the plant-based protein powder, yeah, which is, yeah. which is huge, yeah. Yeah, they had done a really amazing job at um, going through that journey and so they got the startup life um, and had a proven track record of navigating that successfully. Um, so they joined us and then um, the next bucket from there was operations. Um, and so bringing on board a, a director of ops, which we met through Vega. So Vega quickly became this um, kind of uh, open door to amazing humans that, um, that lended itself well in a few of our first initial hires um, and the synergies of them working together previously. Um, and then the third bucket was finance. Um, and so we brought in board a financial controller. Um, and then the fourth bucket was innovation. Um, and so bring someone on who's kind of our Willy Wonka. Um, and all those buckets were kind of informed by um, um, conversations with my advisors. Um, where they really helped me to map out, hey, Tara, I think this could be a gap here. Um, an example is financial controller. I did not think we needed one. I was like, what? No, we're way too early on for a financial controller. We'll just use a contractor that we're using now. Um, but that's my numbers is not is not my strength. It's my weakness <laughs> spreadsheets. And, and so um, really leaning on my advisors to help me identify gaps I may not have seen myself. Um, so those were, I guess, kind of the core buckets and then we built out those teams from there um, and the most recent hire um, which was another one that I really leaned on my advisors for because I didn't necessarily understand the importance or need for it um, was a COO um, so really someone who um, is incredible at in the day-to-day -day operationally executing and kind of bulletproofing us and getting us to where we need to go from an operations standpoint um, and so she, um, her name is Cindy. She just joined us last week and she's um, an incredible human who came from Starbucks for 18 years and then joined Lululemon. Um, so super grateful to have her and all the other squad members. So you built an incredible team. Um, oh my gosh, I, I'm just grateful to like have these humans that are like, like they're just, they live and breathe values that we share, but also that make me want to be a better human every day. And then secondly, they're just Einstein's and what they actually do. And um, we all are just very much um, open with one another where nobody has an ego. We're not 
we're not tied to what's worked in the past. We acknowledge the past, but acknowledge that there may be a better way of doing things in the future um, and are all just really tied to believing that um, the world needs more products that kick sugar and just raising that larger question together of why sugar even exists in such an excessive way in our foods in 2018. Totally. Awesome. <laughs> You know, from this point, it sounds like the journey, and I know it hasn't been, but it sounds like just a upward trajectory of, you know, we got into this store, then we, you know, got into, you know, Whole Foods, we got into all the, and I know it was, it was difficult. Talk about some of the missteps, some of the learnings along the way. Yeah, oh my gosh, I feel like, I feel like every single day there's, there's um, just like fires, blowing up everywhere and and, um, and kind of I guess we try and approach every single day of kind of like what's missing or like or what what should we be paranoid about and what gaps exist that we need to address and and kind of the I guess mindset that if we feel like we have it all figured out which we don't then that the moment we think that is the moment where we actually are set out to fail so always um, having that sense of urgency to find out what we're missing has been really important. Um, there's been, gosh, there's been so, um, so much in the day to day and, and the month to month, I guess a few, um, kind of recent examples are, um, one is we launched with Whole Foods nationwide in the U S and in March, um, we were supposed to ship to UNFI, the distributor, um, by a certain date. And if we missed that cutoff date, we essentially were going to miss the launch. Um, and we got to a point where where we essentially shipped and it arrived on the day of. So mm -hmm. within a, a window of 24 hours of missing this national massive launch. Um, another one was last summer. Um, our e-commerce um, in shipping out orders, we quickly realized that our bears were melting on people's doorsteps. And mm. so thousands of people were getting globs of gummy on their doorsteps um, and instead of um, the formed gummy bears that you know and love. Um, and then one, one that I look back on and I'm like, that was just truly serendipitous, um, was a month after launching initially on shelves, um, I realized quickly that I was going to run out of inventory mm. and didn't have the cash flow necessary to facilitate the larger run um, and building out our forecast I had listened to a lot of advice where it was like everyone creates these astronomic numbers be very conservative and realistic um, and I realized that I was way too conservative and way too realistic um, and I had maxed out our debt financing so I was really in this place where I was like oh my god I'm gonna be like out of stock for eight weeks um, and we were doing a demo in a local grocer here met this woman um, who was an angel investor in the food world from New York. Um, I went for coffee with her. Um, and then the second time I met her, um, we met at this like boutique hotel she was staying at downtown. Um, she And she just really believed what we were doing. I didn't have any prepared financials or decks or anything of that sort. Um, and she cut an $80,000 check in that meeting. Um, so that was a really kind of um, save my ass moment where I was really a, a matter of weeks from running out of product um, and someone took the dive and believed in us. But yeah, every single day, I think. You're like, that just happened this morning. No, all this stuff just happened this yeah. morning. Um, <laughs> so how do you prevent, you know, when you're shipping it to hot climates, right, it melting like that? I mean, is can you even prevent that? What do you do? Yeah, there, I mean, there's a few different things that, um, and I mean, Amazon is is one that's an interesting one to navigate as well, because um, because they can flag your product if it's temperature sensitive, and then you have to only ship seasonally, which essentially takes out half the year, yeah. which is a, a big chunk. Um, and so there's a few things with carriers where you can request a signature, for example. Mm won't leave it on a hot doorstep somebody will have to actually sign before they pass off the product um, so just little tweaks like that that make all the difference between it sitting on a front porch or it being delivered in someone's hands totally mm -hmm. Tara, th this has been fantastic Tara I have 
Two last questions, and everyone should check out smartsweets.com or if you're in Whole Foods or Target or any of these stores, check them out. I've tried them. They're, I'm, they're surprisingly healthy, right? When you, when you eat a gummy bear, you look at a gummy bear, you're like, there's no way this is going to be healthy. And I think there's, you guys have a lot of fiber in this too, I think, um, as well, right? Yeah, there's 28 grams of plant-based fiber per bag. Yeah. It's awesome. So check it out, um, especially if you have kids who like candy. They think it's very, a very just a, a normal candy and it's not. Um, <laughs> talk briefly just for a second. One, um, I always ask, um, what's been a low moment? And then on the flip side, what's been a really proud moment for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I, I think for me, a low moment um, was the moment where um, a month, the, and I know I shared on this example briefly before, but, but a month before launching on shelves, our manufacturer dropped out um, because at this point it had been um, just under a year, so like 11 months of buildup of just waking up, convincing myself every single day before I got out of bed that I'm capable and that I'm going to make this happen and just driving forward when it felt like the wind was pushing in the opposite direction against me, but just driving through that. And then we arrive at this point where we have these retailers on board and everyone's exciting. It's happening. I'm like, this thing is coming to life. And then boom, all of a sudden it's not happening. I have no manufacturer or no way of getting the product to the retailers and I lose a lot of those retail partners. So for me, that was a really low point because it was a moment where I had to really dig deep and just sat in the office um, and, and just felt like really, really just forced me to pull that Crushing. conviction yeah. on myself. Yeah, so that was, I think, definitely a moment where, I guess not even a low moment, but just a moment where I knew that I had to take that feeling of I don't, th this feels impossible and turn that into, okay, this is going to be an opportunity that I'm going to look back on one day, which it did end up being one of the biggest blessings because it changed the company's name from Stevie Sweets to Smart Sweets. Um, the a high moment I think for me is, um, was definitely when we launched nationwide across the U.S. with Whole Foods. That was a really fun moment because that launch came from kind of um, thin air, where a year before that, um, Fox Business was gracious enough to cover Smart Sweets, and the global confectionery buyer from Whole Foods just happened to see it, emailed me, and then this national launch happened. Um, so that was a ex really exciting standpoint because most of our tribe lives in the US, so from an accessibility standpoint and from a really manifesting the mission and what we're wanting to create for people. It was a big step forward. Um, and so that was a really um, powerful moment, I think, for the whole squad um, as a whole. Totally. Well, yeah. congratulations on all the success and future success and innovation. I know it's a daily grind, there's daily fires, but you, know, you have that mindset, that relentless mindset, just to, to keep it going. So thank you for what you do from me, my two daughters, and people who want healthy choices for this stuff. And everyone should go check out smartsweets.com. Anywhere else, Tara, we should have people check out online. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yeah, Smart Sweets on Amazon. Cool. Yeah. Smart Sweets on Amazon, or if you're in Whole Foods, I want to be the first one, Tara. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. What I got can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.